All right, I'm going to clumsily use this microphone because I'm out of practice. <clears throat> so this is the IOMAP buff. Um, I was going to use it to talk about a few long planned improvements and things that I've been meaning to do to make to IOMAP but have never had time because I've been too busy trying to get online repair merged for XFS. So that having fi having kind of finished that, I can finally get back to IOMAP. So IOMAP was pulled out of XFS years ago so that we could try to share some of the page cache and direct IO access code with other file systems. It was designed in a naive era before Spectre and Meltdown told us that, oh, I guess we can't have indirect function calls anymore. So Willie and I have been slowly thinking about and kind of implementing ways to get rid of the indirect function calls. The part I haven't done yet is getting rid of IOMAP and IOMAP again and pushing the loop logic into file systems which I think we can do, but I don't know if we actually want to do that because now that adds a bunch of boilerplate loopy code into file systems and we all know how well file systems tend to do with copy pasted code over and over and over again. It is kind of nice to abstract all that and not under FSIO map and each FS can just call that and not have to worry about what the heck actually goes on in there. So that's a largest cleanup pa patch that I've been kind of thinking about doing for a while. Dave? Do you, do you have any idea of what the actual overhead those indirect calls actually cost us? Because, um, I mean, I, it, I'm just interested to know, to, you know, we've got to be able to measure whether it's an improvement or not. So I was just interested, because the, the IMAP begin, IMAP end calls aren't mm -hmm. the most, yeah, aren't the hottest path through the, the the IMAP codes, whether that's you know something that will actually result in a significant reduction in CPU usage or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I haven't really looked at how much CPU time do we save by doing that. My, to be honest, my primary motivation for any of that at all is actually cleaning up the mess of I don't remember what source map does anymore. And you pass two of these things into every IO map again, and most of them don't actually use it. And I think we were using it for copy on write, but then there were other places where we didn't use it. And I thought it would be a lot simpler if the file system, since the file system knows whether or not source map even matters, it can go call its own IO map begin function with exactly the mapping objects that it needs, and then throw those at IO map versus this thing now where it's like sometimes. I think confusingly for page cache writes, we don't set source map even for ref linked data blocks, but then they do show up for map blocks for write back and it's sort of hard to follow. Yeah, so maybe, I mean, I've been looking at that. There's a couple of issues uh, and also looking at how we might be able to do for XFS the copy on write and the direct IO path rather than having to fall back to the, the um, the buffered path to do it. Um, one of the things there is, is that I was thinking that maybe what we actually need to do is separate out the copy on write code and the operations that, that does from the the iterators that don't even don't even need to know about, don't even need to be aware of copy on write, and so don't need to have a source map. They only need the one map of the thing that they're supposed to operate on. So mm -hmm. maybe it's a case that we need a, a second iterator, one that's copy on write aware that uses two maps and one, the existing one, that doesn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, because I think there are a lot of file systems that aren't going to care about copy on write and will just get confused by it. Yeah. Let's see, other things. I do intend someday to get around to doing something with the de with the device pointer for FIMAP so that we can actually tell you which device, which block device actually goes with whatever mapping that FIMAP returns. It's been something that's been kind of asked for for years and I have left it languishing on my bucket list of things to do before I die. Let's see. Interestingly, I saw today, this just this morning that the new EXT2 Rust driver actually wraps IOMAP, which has uncovered a whole bunch of interesting things that I just noticed and I'm still kind of digesting. 
Um, let's see. So I think the goofiest part, the goofiest part I thought about a lot of that was that there seems to be a lot of like glue code bindings between the C versions of IOMAP and what you have to do to get inline functions to work and all that stuff with Rust. I did talk to Wedson earlier about this, so that will hopefully get ironed out, but it could be interesting to actually see what happens if file systems start using IOMAP for their Rust implementations. So one, one quick comment since you brought up uh, uh, Rust and you had mentioned the indirect calls before. Uh, in Rust we can actually have generic code that doesn't have indirect calls. So there's maybe an opportunity there for, mm -hmm. for better implementations and more performance implementations in the future. Mm -hmm. Oh, I did have a question about that. So I noticed that there's this, I think it was file system for each page function that takes some kind of lambda function or really uh, something that looks like a function pointer, but the couple of cases I saw were actually just lambdas, and I was kind of wondering, does Rust actually turn, the, does that Rust actually get rid of the indirect call for all of that and just staple that into one big function where there's no indirection? That's right, yes. If it's, if it's a, a lambda with the impo fn or fn1s, then it does. It, it optimizes that uh, and takes away mm. the, the lambda. There's no lambda involved there. Cool. Uh, but of course, if there's a, a pointer involved, then, then, then no, but uh, mm -hmm. in most cases, it, it's able to do it, yes. Hmm, cool. All right, let's see other things. Um, let's see, I, I do plan to get around to re reviewing the IOMAP documentation. It, it's been kind of, I've been letting things stall for a while, as you all have probably noticed. <clears throat> uh, let's see, Ritesh? Yeah, uh, like one question was, uh, IOMAP also has the bufferhead path, uh, and I think uh, GFS2 currently uses it. And when I was looking at ext2 conversion, I felt that that bufferhead path just creates another unnecessary path, and can can we kind of not have that and maybe let the file system directly move to IOMAP and not have any dependency on say bufferheads. Yeah, so the 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 IOMAP bufferhead flag uh, should not be used by any new conversion. It's it's there, f you know. It's largely there for a specific case with GFS two where they couldn't convert certain things from bufferheads because of their wacky INO locking the glocks and so on. So um, there was. There were issues with that, and and uh, you know, in all of the other cases where we've got buffer heads, we don't have uh, those sorts of lock inversion problems and whatnot with with the Glocks that Gluster has. So they should be able to simply be converted straight to IOMAP and not use buffer heads at all. Um, so that's kind of a, that was kind of a temporary thing to get the GFS2 code to work with IOMAP because they had significant uh, buffered write, uh, you know, sequential buffered write performance issues that needed the large, you know, to do with the block mapping. So they needed to do, you know, basically convert to the, the IOMAP structure of do the mapping once, then iterate the pages. Um, and so that was like a three or four times uh, bandwidth improvement on sequential writes for, for GFS2 just by switching to IOMAP for that. Um, but we couldn't get rid of buffer heads out of the, the, the IO path for them because of other reasons. So I, I do see that in IOMAP we have added that uh, uh, a folio operation so that like you know when so the, I think the lock folio was uh, the locking was kind of a problem in GFS2 and now they are actually calling their own uh, a lock folio, uh, but other than that, is there like uh, should I take uh, that bufferhead path also has to do something with the journaling transaction, and is it something that is not been sorted out? So let's say when somebody tried to take a look at ext4, so, so the 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 page operation or the get folio operation for GFS2 is because of the glocks and the locking order um, and the buffer heads are for the way it does write back. It actually attaches all of the dirty pages via buffer heads to their active item list in the journal and they do write back from there. Um, so it's like an, an ordered write back similar to the way EXT3 used to do write back um, and so 
without actually completely rewriting the way the GFS2 journal works, we can't get rid of buffer heads out of it because that's how they track their dirty data and do write back. Yeah, exactly. Like when I saw the uh, the buffer head path of IOMAP, it's it's just that it's exactly the same path. It's just that it weighs, it maps it now much better, and so maybe the performance was good for GFS2. So yeah, I mean, it's good to know. I, you know the point. So basically, what we are saying is not to move to buffer head approach of IOMAP, and maybe the soon. Uh, we get rid of it, that's much better. Yeah, so, I mean, from the documentation point of view, you know, IOMAP buffer head should be flagged, do not use. <laughs> yeah, that's, that, that makes sense, yeah. yeah. Yep, uh, while we're on that topic, so at this point, the page cache write methods and the write back methods each have grown their own slightly separate write and validation cookie. And I've been wondering, I've been meaning to ask you, Dave, about can we actually unify those, or is there a particular reason why one only samples the uh, XFS data fork and the other one samples data and cow? Okay, so the answers to that, uh, the, the only reason for that happening is that we needed something, we couldn't use the mechanism that the write back path used in the write path. Um, because we can't wrap, we didn't have an ION structure that we could wrap or write page control that we could wrap with the XFS stuff. Um, the second answer is yes, we should convert the, the, the write page code to use the validity cookie that's now in the IO map, and we can remove the XFS wrapper around the outside of that that has that. Um, the third question one uses uh, the data sequence, one uses the data and cow sequence. Mm -hmm. um, I thought they both used the, yeah. they encoded both of them. Um, I'll have to go and look at the code, but they should be using the same thing. I think uh, the, I think what happens is in the copy on write case, when we're actually got a, an active source map, it sets both the data sequence and the cow sequence yep. in the validity cookie in the write path. And in the write back path, it just sets both of them anyway. Um, mm -hmm. it, yeah, they should. Yeah, you know, yeah. They I, can I, use the same thing. Is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. and they should. And I, the only reason it hasn't been done is I haven't had time to do it. Well, <laughs> neither have I. So. Yeah. So it, it it was. I always planned when I did the right side to fix that corruption bug that I would bring that that validity check back into the the right back side so that they use the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it did. It did occur to me that maybe there actually was a reason for not including the cow fork sequence counter for the page cache write because we don't care what's in the cow fork at that point, and that might lead to unnecessary ca page cache invalidate revalidations. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I I, I think the way I wrote it, I have. I have to look at the code, but I think the case was that in the specific case where we fill out the source map, it fi also fills in the cow sequence. So mm -hmm. when we're using two maps, it's got both sequence numbers in it. Um, mm -hmm. All right, other questions I've heard during this conference. So Willie and I apparently disagree as to whether or not we re read dirty pages for write back after write back fails. I thought we'd gotten rid of it. Okay, yeah, I thought we had gotten rid of it, but... Mm -hmm. I, I thought we fixed that 18 months ago. To, you know, to, to, to actually keep the dirty pages in, in memory if write back failed. Because uh, what we originally did with XFS is we, we get a write back failure, we just mm -hmm. chuck the, the pages out of cache. I oh, right, I, right. I we, thought we, we fixed that to just re-dirty them to make it behave like everybody else, uh, every other file system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, yeah. That, this is starting to remember that now. It's been a long four years. Let's see. Uh, a little while ago, there was some discussion on the ext4 call about what exactly should direct I/O be doing in terms of falling back to buffered writes? Because now that ext4 uses IOMAP for direct I/O, the semantics of when it does fallback are different and more closely aligned with XFS, simply because that's what the code does. So we were kind of wondering if we should actually make a stronger statement about let's let's not fall back from direct I/O to buffered unless it's something where we have to like unaligned direct writes on a shared block for XFS. Yeah, I, yeah. Just to clarify here, I think one of the things that happened was uh, ext4 had mirrored the legacy Unix behavior, which was very aggressive fallback to buffered I/O 
for a number of situations, including misaligned starting offset, um, IO errors at the beginning uh, of a write request, et cetera. And I think there is, given that XFS has switched to a strict model of almost never falling back, and we have not seen screams from user space applications, I am wondering whether or not EXD4, and perhaps we should make this be a broader statement that applies to all file systems, that we adopt a strict no fallback model to buffered um, I.O. for direct I.O. Uh, because apparently when EXD4 switched to using the IOMAP infrastructure, the IOMAP infrastructure grew support for falling back to buffered so that it wouldn't change ext4 behavior and the block device direct io apparently also mirrors the old legacy unix behavior and um you know i am interested in changing ext4 to adopt a strict no fallback mechanism because you know that's up to ext4 um, i want to ask the broader question about whether we should be doing that for all of our various direct io well, I mean, this is uh, just to put in context. XFS has always done this. It's it's never returned a short write uh, for direct I/O. So it's not something we switched to recently, and so on. This is something that XFS basically inherited from IRIX, and it was put in place in 1994. Um, so we've always, you know, direct I/O doesn't do short writes. If you don't get the whole write done, it just fails. It. Um, and it's then up to user space to deal with whatever mess they've just created. Um, and it goes along with direct I.O. in that if anything goes wrong with direct I.O., it's up to the application to correct the problem that occurred. Um, if you do overlapping direct I.O., um, the result is undefined. It's up to the user space to ensure that it does not do overlapping concurrent direct I.O. Um, and so, from that same perspective, uh, you know, if you get a short write, then the I/O hasn't been completed that the that user space asked for. So we simply, in that case, return zero. The the write didn't happen. Um, so having uh, all the file systems behave the same would be ideal. Um, ha having file systems as they convert to IOMAP move from whatever model they had to this, you know, no short writes don't fall back to buffered IO to complete the bit that the direct IO didn't do, that's fine. Um, but realistically, I don't think IOMAP dictate, should, you know, needs to dictate what the behaviour here is. This is just a policy that individual file systems can decide on. And in the case with XFS is that we do actually need, at the moment, a fallback to buffered I.O. for copy on write cases. Um, and as I was mentioning earlier to, to Derek, that's something that I'm looking at is actually handling copy on writes direct in the direct I.O. code. Because there are, you know, hooks in the, co in the direct I.O. code for ButterFS to do its thing. Um, and so we should be able to do you know direct IO copy on write without falling back to buffered IO in most situations. Um, so but that I mean but there's still going to be situations where we will have to fall back to buffered IO because we've got a partial block or something of the sort like that. Um, and we can't do things like zero, we have to read <coughs> data in. Um, so I think there's always going to be situations where we need a fallback to, to, to buffered, buffered I.O. And so I think it's up to the file system itself to decide what to do with the eno block error that comes back when a short write comes from a direct I.O. Um, yeah, I agree that, like, for ext4, actually, and the main reason why I added the fallback code into IOMAP back then was that, you know, when, when you have the old disk format, which doesn't really support unwritten extents, then you really cannot do di safely do direct IO in the middle of the file because, you know, you would basically expose uninitialized data. So, so in that case, basically, we have no choice with the old on disk format but fallback or return error, but then 
uh, this this would be really problematic, and I would expect that in that case we would find some user space complaining. So, uh, so, so I, I realistically I don't see a way to completely abandon the fallback to buffered I/O in the XT4 case either, uh, because uh, like for the at least for the old disk format file systems, uh, yeah. But we can talk whether we want to like go closer to what XFS does for the new disk format, like refusing the I.O. instead of falling back. If you're doing unwritten extent allocation for your direct I.O., then you don't have to worry about partial writes um, or short writes because you don't run I.O. completion in that case, and so you're not yep. converting the extent to written, so it's as though the I.O. never occurred. Um, so, you know, there's, there's no stale data exposure issues Yeah, there. Th there we can support yeah. it yeah. pretty easily, like just... Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I think the if we need to support ext2 style indirect block style writes, that falls in the same sort of copy on write sort of. Yeah, in those cases we can't. But uh, the the observation that I was making was there was confusion about what would happen on the I/O error case, um, and you know. There were people who were surprised that ext4 was silently falling back to buffered, and then we started looking, and then we realized, oh, the block device code is also silently falling back to buffered I/O, and I think in the cases where you can safely not fall back and return an error, perhaps it would be useful to make some sort of statement at least as advice to file system implementers. I mean, yeah. ext4 can make the change that we want to make. Um, we'll submit a patch to change what the block device direct I.O. code does, and we'll see what happens with that you know, RFC patch. But you know, yeah. it was a surprise that the fallback was happening in those cases, and I think that was the thing that I wanted to at least elevate. Yeah. yeah, so I think if you're getting an EIO or some kind of error from the storage on the direct write, you don't want to fall back to buffered I.O. because yeah. it's likely you, all you're doing is writing the data into the page cache and then buffered write back is going to get EIO anyway. Right, and, and user space will not check. Yeah, and yeah. Yeah. You, you've lost the error. <laughs> right. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's a case of, you know, if you get the the, the the case from the IO map code that says uh, I can't do a direct IO in this situation, which is the Eno not block um, yeah. uh, uh, error message, in that case you can choose to fall back to to, to buffered IO if you want or not. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you choose not to fall back to buffered IO, just return zero because nothing was written. Um, otherwise, do the rest of the IO or do the whole IO as buffered IO. Right. Um, yep. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of the questions that came up when I was working on the uh, LBS patch set was sublog zeroing for direct mm -hmm. IO. Uh, the, right now we loop. It's fine for 64K. That's the maximum block size we support in XFS. But once we use block devices, the, the logical block size could be bigger if you use IOMAP for buffer cache. And there was a few ideas floating around. Like one is at mount time, allocate a huge uh, page and, and use it to do sub block uh, zeroing if, the, if it's greater than page size. And I was talking with you, uh, mm -hmm. Derek, yesterday, and then you had some ideas about. So oh, yeah. So the, the question was whether it's like, should be the IOMAP's responsibility to allocate something mm -hmm. or. Yeah, so, yeah. so assuming a heterogeneous world where we have multiple file systems with all kinds of different large block sizes. We need, for direct I.O., we need to have zero, we would like to have zero pages that we can attach to sub-block direct I.O. writes so that we can tell the block device, write, this, write these zeros. Right now, I, th I was kind of hoping Christoph would be here, but I guess we'll just decide something and tell him what he agreed to. <clears throat> But we thought, it, right now, I think the proposal was, we'll allocate a PMD zero and then call that, well, here's your zero page. But that's two megabytes, and that kind of sucks for a 64K block file system because that's too big. So, so what I was thinking of is, what if we had some way to dynamically allocate various sized zero pages and then hand them out depending on whatever we managed to allocate? And does anybody else want that? Hi. Hello. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I think it's fine. I, I, I think it's... So, I mean, what I'm 
what I would really like is for there to be some uh, fallback. Mm -hmm. um, like the MM could guarantee that you'll get at least 64k, uh, and you, you, you. It, please, please ask for more. And uh, if we can give you more, we'll give you more. But please be willing to accept a 64k as, as the smaller size you had. Would that be a reasonable solution to everyone? Uh, I don't think we even need to worry about that. Um, we have to. We've got an init function for IOMAP. Um, because we've got an initialize bio sets and stuff like that, so we've got to do allocation at that point. Let's just put an internal uh, folio in, you know, global folios for the cold. We allocate as a 64k folio, and call that out the IO map zero page. And whenever we're doing direct IO, we don't map the, the the huge page or the zero page or so on. We use the IO map zero page for all of that. Um, and we get around all the problems of, you know, this particular API needs a MM context, this API uh, can only give us two megabyte pages and so on. And we don't have to dynamically allocate it on a per IO basis or a per file system basis or per mount basis or anything like that. We just have one, I mean, we could e even just make it a, uh, a static you know, 64K page um, or something sort of like that. And we so just map that every single time we need to, to do it. We don't need it to be dynamically allocated. Exactly. All we're doing it is mapping it into a bio which takes a reference to the, the underlying folio, mm -hmm. folio and then on IO completion releasing that reference. So as long as there's a one other reference that is held by the IO map infrastructure, we can use that for every single IO that's in flight and we don't need to do dynamic allocation of it. And actually, so, so I'm kind of wondering, but I, maybe I'm missing something, but why don't just use the zero page we have? Like that's, that's what we use in DAX, yeah? yeah. In DAX, mm -hmm. we basically map everywhere the, the zero page. So, so that's what the patch set uh, does. And Christoph doesn't like it because he thinks iterating the zero page and mapping it, you know, maybe 16 times or 15 times into uh, a single bio is inefficient. Yeah. Uh, so what he, what he wants to do is is have it well, we have a single folio. We have D zero PMD as well. <laughs> yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. So that's the thing. There are uh, other ways of doing it, but they're not all guaranteed of being available uh, in all. Okay. Okay. Now I get it. And so on, so. Oh, also, it seemed a little excessive to me on platforms where a PMD size is like half a gigabyte to do that just to support a 64k block size. But I don't know. Maybe block sizes will just increase to 512 meg. <laughs> <laughs> Especially for XFS, like I don't see the like. Uh, it's not in, it's not efficient, but it's it's fine. But once like Hannes is talking about uh, implementing large block sizes for block devices, and if it uses IOMAP for interacting with the block cache, then mm -hmm. yeah, then we might. This is more uh, important to see. Uh, how we use it, yeah. Yeah, so uh, I think for a file system, or all our existing file systems, 64K as a block size is pretty much the maximum for the on-disk formats. I mean, XT4 can go up to 64K, XFS yeah. can go up to 64K. Um, ButterFS, the block size is largely irrelevant. Um, you know, their biggest problem is doing, uh, you know, sub block size IO or sub you know page size smaller than block size type stuff. Um, so I think that for for most cases on the file system side, uh, 64k is as big as we need. Um, for block devices, um, I can see that there's certain situations where the block device you might want to set 128k because that's the internal page size of your of flash the, device exactly and whatnot. Yeah. Um, so that you can do things direct to the block device you know, independent of the file system in ways that are optimal for, for that. Um, uh, but you, in that situation, you're not going through the file system. Um, so you're not using the file system block size as your, as your limitation. So if, you're going to be go if we're going to be doing that sort of thing, we need to really consider, um, you know, the, the block device will need, you know, the people doing that when you actually implement the you know greater than 64k support for the um you know block set block size ioctal or whatever it is for yeah. the block device um 
at that time, you know, we have to actually make sure that the IOMAP page is actually set to the same size as what the, the maximum for the block device is set to. So for the block device is set to 128K. Or we could map the 64K page multiple times, right. yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it, it, neither here nor there. It's only a small amount of memory for, for, for that sort of thing. And if we're only allocating one, it doesn't really matter whether it's 64K or 128K. Yeah. Um, you know, you mount XFS and then goes 20 megabytes straight away. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's, it's not really a big problem. If, if we can move on to a different, I'd like to move I valid callback um, just because we hate callbacks. Um, there is 28 bytes currently in structured address space that IOMAP is not and is reserved for IOMAP's usage. Well, which callback is this? IOMAP valid, you added it. Um, that got added into the IOMAP operations, right? Yes. Yeah. I want to get rid of it. Uh, where are you moving it to? Uh, so what I'm saying is that there is 20 bytes available in structured address space that IOMAP could use. So if XFS is willing to store the um, it's storing in the XFS in structured address space instead, IOMAP can just look at that directly to determine if the IOMAP is still valid, rather than calling back into XFS. Yeah, the change cookie, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, in the address space operation structure, that's no, no, not not it's operation structure address. Oh, um, that stuff is actually in the inode fork. We have three inode forks in a in a uh, XFS inode, which means we have six uh, chain six sequence numbers, which are all U thirty two. Yeah, so it, it's something that's internal to the actual inode fork. And when we're actually modifying the inode fork, we're deep in the XFS code and we're not using the Linux inode at all. Um, so it would be a significant layering violation to actually be storing that stuff because we're changing in the middle of XFS transactions. Um, uh, and so, yeah, that's not something that we, we go anywhere near. Uh, the address space is used by data operations, and this is metadata information. Um, it's not actually it's 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 sequence numbers based on the extent tree. Um, so it's metadata used to access the data, um, but it's that metadata is it's it's deeply internal. I guess is the best way of describing it. So even if there is space in the address space for it. Um, I don't think it's the right place to be putting it. Um, it's in the XFS inode, um, in the, the data fork, the attribute fork, and the cow fork. Um, and so two of them are statically allocated in the XFS inode. One of them is dynamically allocated on demand if it's needed. Um, that's the copy on write one. Yeah. Um, so I mean, yes, we could make the XFS inode a bit smaller by doing that. Um, but it, like I said, it then means that we're, we're, we're putting internal metadata into the VFS inode structures, or even, you know, well, address space is really an MM structure, um, kind of, but... Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think it was a file system, a VFS structure. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, uh, I mean, I'm uncomfortable with doing that sort of level of modification. I, we're not that concerned about the memory usage of the, the inode. I mean, plus or minus eight bytes here or there is not going to change the fact that it sits in the 1,024-byte slab. Um, so, you know, um, I don't know. Derek, do you have any, mm -hmm. any particular... Yeah, I, I smell lunch outside, so... <laughs> yeah, I can smell that too. All right.